the more you break your word with yourself, you are literally eating away your subconscious. And then it starts eating into business, your relationships, your relationships with your family, your relationship with yourself. If you say, I am going to get up and go for a five minute walk in the morning, and then you hit snooze three times, you didn't keep your word with yourself. That's the most important person that you cannot break your word with. I'm so excited to have Shelly Bryan with us today. You've heard amazing things about her. Shelly, you are a woman of so many talents. You've lived multiple career lives in just the time I've known you. So where did your business and entrepreneur on, <laughs> and entrepreneur journey start that led you to now owning a multi-million dollar general contracting company? You know, it's so funny. Right when you were introducing that, first off, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited watching all of the changes and, and everything come through for you. You know, when you were just introducing right there, I was thinking about actually it started when I was 13. I negotiated my first horse sale purchase on my own. I did the contract on my own. I did everything on my own. I even like earned the money on my own. I didn't even tell my parents about it. So that's probably <laughs> where it started. But then it really fueled after, you know, college, I went into the financial industry. I built a book of business over $17 million in about two and a half years at 22 years old. Think, you know, boiler room, cold calling, going out on appointments. But that taught me exactly how important it is to listen to your client. So once I understood how you could listen and really serve them based upon their needs, because there are little things that people say that are triggers, right? Whether it's a trigger, a smoke screen, or a problem that they have, that really got me, you know, kind of in that entrepreneurial journey where you can say that was an entrepreneurial, right? But that actually was because I didn't get paid unless I got the business. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. while I was under this huge financial organization, I was still, it was feast or famine. So very similar to entrepreneurial. Wow. Okay. So you got into that world. You were successful. Mm -hmm. Then I know you made a pivot because we've worked together. So I know a little bit about your journey. Not a little bit. I know a lot of it <laughs> about mm -hmm. your journey and just how far you've come. Walk us through becoming a wife and having kids and getting back into corporate field, you know, and then also other entrepreneur journeys that you have failed at, you know, mm -hmm. talk about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, after I was in the financial industry, I went on to a very long career in the pharmaceutical industry, you know, and I'm that pursue more, go greater, go bigger. So I was always uh, looking for opportunities to grow not only my skills, but grow you know, and kind of break that glass ceiling, let's say in, in corporate America world. And while I was doing that, I kind of hit, I actually hit a ceiling. I couldn't break through unless I moved and I wasn't going to move because I had started my family and we were here in Arizona. And the only way for me to go and do more with this organization was to move to Texas. And that was just not something that was going to work for me. So I stayed at the highest position I could be at, but then I started my first side hustle. So I had my full-time job, I had two kids, and I started my side hustle, which was I saw a need within the equine community, the horse community that I participate in, and I created an online platform for buying and selling high-quality reining horses. Wow. Okay, explain to me what is a reining horse. I know yeah. you've explained to me this before, but it's gone in one ear and out the other. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> the, the, best, the best way to say it now is because... Taylor Sheridan, who created Yellowstone. Have you ever seen Yellowstone? Okay. Yes, I'm, a big fan. I'm sure our listeners here have as well seen Yellowstone. So I actually show horses with Taylor Sheridan, who is the creator of, of Yellowstone, and he's really brought light. So it's a Western event. A lot of people, when they think horses, they think like Olympics, right? Jumping, dressage. Nope, I'm a cowgirl. So what it is, it's a very high degree of difficulty event. It's not based upon time. It's based upon finesse. And so when we are competing with our horses, it's just the rider and the horse in the arena. We have three to five judges, depending upon the competition. The prize money is anywhere from in the hundreds to the hundreds of thousands to now million. Taylor actually partners and, and does a 
huge competition called the Run for a Million that is held in Vegas every year. So it's a really fun event and just fuels that competition spirit that I have. (laughs) So you got that going and how was that successful? Yes, it absolutely was. But here's the thing that I was facing is I was in a horse, the horse industry, which at the time wasn't ready for technology. Like, in fact, they definitely pushed against it. So there was a lot of education, which was really nice learning experience because I had to step back because I got it. Most of my like peers who were competitors got it, but a lot of the industry professionals, like the, the cowboys, let's call them cowboys, cowgirls, they really didn't understand the process. And so there was a lot of education that had to go on, but it came, it became the number one platform being used to buy and sell high quality horses. So when I say high quality, I'm talking six figure horses online. So what I did is create not a platform for anyone to have options to see these horses. Cause a lot of times it's kind of that like behind the scene deals, like a real estate deal where you just kind of know the person that knows yeah. the person. Yeah. So basically the same so thing. You created a marketplace. Horses, essentially. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But then 2020 hit and I noticed that everyone needed access to information. People weren't able to show their horses that much. They were, you know, bringing the horses out of training, keeping them at home, and they needed access to information. So I pivoted that company again and grew it into a media company where actually in 2022, we reached over 3.2 million people um, providing education as well as entertainment in a live setting. So it was a really neat experience. That's amazing. And you, that was your passion project, would you call it? Like you were passionate about it. That was absolutely fair. You know, I had a ton of experience in sales and so that I could read the market, I could help kind of create uh, scenarios or opportunities to connect buyers and sellers together. It was a great, great passion project. But sometimes when you're passion, right, because my daughter and I show horses now, sometimes you kind of want it to stay a passion and not be a job. So definitely making some transitions in that uh, business right now. So it's been a season of pivots. Let's just call that, call it that. Absolutely. Just in our time working together, you've pivoted uh, a lot, which I love because you have to figure out what it is that is really meant for you. Usually by doing the things you think are the, the right way, the right path and getting on it and going, this isn't for me and just keep going until you find the thing that is for you. And so I'm so proud of you that you've now transitioned into multiplying Chris's efforts mm-hmm. with the general contracting business. So I remember our VIP day with you and Chris, and we were talking about all the things and all of the business that he had, you know, available to him. And I remember like watching you like with the lights around, like, oh my gosh, like this, this is like a big opportunity here. Mm -hmm. So tell me what was it like, what was happening in your mind to go, okay, you know what? I'm going to go all in. I'm going to just focus on helping him build this and come in and compliment him where he was weak. You're strong, basically. You guys compliment each other so well. Yeah, we really do. We're very fortunate that way. And, you know, I'm actually going to step it back because in Q4 last year, Chris came to me and he was like, what if, because he had another business as well, right? So he had his general contracting business and then he had another business. And he's like, what if we went all in on this together, right? I shut down my other business. You stopped participating in your other businesses and we just go all in on the construction. And I had helped out kind of behind the scenes, but I hadn't really been ever forward facing on it. And part of that, Kayla, honestly, was my ego is Mm -hmm. I needed to get my ego out of the way because I had always had my own way. I had always had my own thing. And while Chris and I, we've been together 22 years, married 18, like we've done everything together. We still had a lot of separate things. And just really because we're we're so passionate about multiple things, but we just never came together. And he's like, what if we do this? And so we dove into the numbers. And once he started showing me the numbers, I'm like, shall I get out of your own damn way? This is where it needs to be. And it was quite honestly an easy decision. And once we have came together on everything, it's just been unbelievable once we had that focus. And it was just understanding. And I think you know, I I hear this referred to a lot. I've used it is like taking the red pill. I saw the red pill of abundance 
instead of it being so far away and me not understanding what it was like, I finally saw like, oh, wait, she can win and I can win. And that is actually better. Let me boost her up because I feel better doing that. And so once I saw like that opportunity, that's when a lot changed. That's part of the reason why I created my podcast and even how we are helping other general contractors now, other subcontractors. I'm not just providing them work, but we're helping them understand how to make more money. It's really been a, a fantastic shift uh, to be able to recognize that. And, and even like I just had coffee with a friend not too long ago, and she's doing what I used to in the financial market. And so I was talking to her and she's worried about, you know, what some Netflix person is talking about with finance and I have to fix that. And it's not the same way that we did it. And it just like all this. And I finally just put my hand on her and I said, there's enough. Don't worry about what anyone else is doing in competition. Don't worry about them. Focus on finding the right customers that you're going to vibe with. And it was just like, immediately she just let her guard down. And she was like, you're right. I'm like, there's so many people out there that we can help. Don't worry about what your competition's doing. Yes. So now that you have that mindset, you're working with your husband, Chris, Mm -hmm. not everybody is cut out to work with their spouse, but what has been the biggest challenge and the biggest blessing of working together in your contracting company? Yeah, no, I love this. Um, We have this conversation all the time because yeah, working with your spouse, who the heck? But a lot of people are like, never could I ever. Mm -hmm. I actually love it. And we complement each other. Like you mentioned earlier, you know, my weakness is his strength. So we're very compatible in that way. But I would say, honestly, the biggest challenge is turning it off. There's so much good stuff going on right now. You know, we have two kids, 10 and 13, or excuse me, 11 and 13 now. Holy cow. We have horses at home, dogs, we want to travel, we have lots of stuff, but we also are having so much fun working and the business is thriving so much that we have a home office and we have had to work really hard to set that boundary of like, okay, we're done. Now it's family time. No phones, no tablets, no nothing like like our tablets that we're using to manage a project, like no laptops or anything like that. So we definitely have been working as setting those boundaries. And it is getting better. It's really us holding each other accountable to do it. Now, on the flip side, the biggest blessing is that we are finding new ways to do things because we both think differently. You know, one of the coolest things is that our goals are aligned. So our goals are aligned with the company, but we have different ways on getting there. And based upon Chris's experience, he is absolutely field-based when it comes to the construction business, he's managing on the crews, he's on the site. I'm more behind the scenes, relationships, doing all of the marketing, but we, we have very different ways of getting there. And there's experiences that I've had with different systems that he hasn't really seen yet. And so sometimes we'll have friction because he's like, I want to do it this way. And I'm like, but here's this other way. And so it's taking that moment to really just be like, okay, We know we have the goal. Let me stop and listen. And we both have to do that because we both want to win. So we have to stop and listen to the other person so that we can see if it is a good fit. And sometimes it's trying, trying and failing. I love to fail. Let me just fail fast and get it over with. Yeah. Well, success requires failure. You know, it requires you trying a lot of things and finding out what doesn't work. So I love that the biggest blessing to you is, is learning that you guys have different ways of doing things and you're being open-minded to each, each other's experience, right? Because that just, I feel like when you learn and you learn a new way of doing things, it expands you. And I think that's what makes us happy at the end of the day is being expanded and feeling fulfilled. Yeah, no, I, I could not agree more. What do you think is the common thread that has helped you create success in every area of life? And I'm talking about health, If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you know, look at Shelly. She takes care of herself. She eats right. She's always like, that was one thing that she was really focused on for a while was her, you know, teaching other people health. So you have that going on. You have a fantastic marriage. I remember telling you and Chris, like, you guys need to teach people how to be married because you're so good at it. (laughs) And, you know, you have that going on. You have good friendships in your life. You love the Lord. And, you know, I just see you thriving in every area, which makes me so happy. But what is the common thread? that's helped you be successful in those areas? I think that there's a few things. I I can't pick just one, but the one thing that we've always done 
And uh, this is advice I have shared with so many people. Um, it's truly the only thing that we remember from our wedding ceremony is that our pastor said, don't ever stop doing the things that brought you two together. So above everything else that we have going on, it started with us and we don't take that lightly. So we have two scheduled dates every single week and that gives us a time to focus on us. And so, yes, we'll talk business. Of course we do, right? We're running a business together, of course. But we talk more kind of big picture, not really like problems. You dream together. We're talking about like dreaming. Yeah, we dream the goals, the things that we want to do, kind of the little bit of like gut checks of like, holy cow, we have all this work coming. Is it time to bring on, you know, more more team or how are we going to leverage the, the time that we have? So it's, it's more of that. So it's always focusing on us. I will say, and you know, this story, Kayla is, you know, once, once we came into, you know, being saved, that really changed everything. And I started going to church on my own first, you know, I didn't make Chris do it. It was, I didn't make the, the kids do it. I just started going on my own. Then Chris followed and we've just both been so blessed in, in staying centered with God that it's, it's truly like truly changed our lives. Absolutely. It was such a God thing, how we started working together too, because you had just gotten saved, Mm -hmm. right? I think Mm -hmm. it was like a couple months prior you had just gotten saved. About four months. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You were a baby Christian and Mm -hmm. It's so fun how God works like that. Like he gives you what you need. I feel like I was like a teenager on fire when I met you for the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I just, Mm -hmm. I, all I want to do is talk about Jesus. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) it ended up working out well. (laughs) Now, you know, okay. So I hear like, obviously your faith plays a thread into that and Mm -hmm. then doing what you did to come together. So it's habits, right? It's like you have that habit of, of giving each other you know, fuel for your relationship. And I think habits create our destiny at the end of the day. It's all about your habits. So how has mastering your health habits directly correlated to increasing your income? No, I love this question because I think so often we think that we have to have different sets of habits and learn something entirely brand new in all the various areas of our life. When in reality, we actually have the skill in one area and we literally just need to repurpose it into another area. So it's not Mm -hmm. learning something like brand new and starting this whole new thing. So for me, health came very easy. Obviously, I, I had some major health things happen. And so when that happens, you take it seriously. But I have, you know, an incredible morning routine. I have a nutrition routine. I have a workout routine that works for me. And I know some of your listeners right now are probably like, oh my God, she's that gym six days a week hour. She probably never eats a carb, never drinks. No, I do all of that. And I go to the gym twice a week. I've been able to create a system, right? That that has been very easy for me to accomplish my health. I now take that same ability to create systems to now increase productivity when it comes to my business, because we're managing the business. We're managing the marketing. I have a a team of four VAs plus a project manager. So I am managing all of them. We also have our two kids being able to manage that, you know, manage making dinner every night. All of this has to come down to systems and it's that commitment to the habit. You are right. Habits are incredibly important and they can make make or break you. I actually just had this conversation with my daughter Reese last night. She's doing an incredible camp here this summer. And we were talking about keeping our word with the most important person. And she goes, I go, who is that? And she said, me. And I said, absolutely. So important to teach our kids that. It's so important. And so it was, it was just such a great conversation to be able to elaborate what she was learning in this camp. It's an incredible camp here in Scottsdale, but just keeping your word with yourself, right? Because the more you break your word with yourself, you are literally eating away your subconscious. And then it starts eating into business, your relationships, 
your relationships with your family, your relationship with yourself, right? So if you say, I am going to get up and go for a five minute walk in the morning, and then you hit snooze three times and now you're late and you can't got to get out to work, you didn't keep your word with yourself. That's the most important person that you cannot break your word with. So whatever it is, whether it's your health, whether it's your business, whether it's the relationship, you said you were going to make cookies with your daughter and you're so tired. I get it at the end of the day. You're so tired. Make the dang cookies with your daughter because you said you were going to do it and she is watching you. So good. That's all people ask me all the time. How do you get more confidence? And it, it starts with that. It's when you start keeping your word to yourself, your confidence boosts every single day when you do what you say you were going to do to yourself. So I love that reminder. I want to talk about real estate investing. Just, you know, this is like what I'm the most passionate about talking about. Yes, let's do it. And we talked a little bit before this episode started because I really want to teach people how to protect themselves when they start working with contractors Mm -hmm. in their real estate projects. We have a ton of real estate investors listening in. What should they look for in a good contractor? I like to compare it when you're hiring a good contractor. It's so, gosh, the story as I've heard about poor contractors, but also in that same story, they're like, I had a gut feeling. Yes. I had a gut feeling that this wasn't going to work out yet. It's so hard to find one. We make decisions based upon emotion, not based upon fact. So just like when you're hiring any other professional, put them in the same category as an attorney. If you're hiring an attorney, is that attorney educated in the specific skill that you need to get, you know, feedback on, right? You're not going to hire a family attorney when you have a business law issue. You need something very, very different, right? So same thing. Are they skilled? Do they have the experience? Do they have common business etiquette, meaning return phone calls, return emails in a timely manner. Now, here's what I will say. What timely manner is, that's something that needs to be a set expectation. So when you engage a general contractor, you need to be like, hey, what is your expected response time? Because everyone has a different expected response time, right, Kayla? Like sometimes it's like, I, 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 need, I need an answer now. Or it's like, hey, get to me this week. But unless that expectation is set, there's going to be a miscommunication, which always causes issues. So um, it is as much the responsibility of the general contractor as it is whoever is hiring them to set that expectation on communication. If they don't meet that expectation, there's a red flag, right? There is a red flag. Yeah, because if they if they don't meet the expectation before money has been even transferred, then once the money is transferred, what they're going to do is even less. You know, you, you get people on their best behavior in the beginning. Of course, because they're trying to win the bid, right? They're trying to win the bid to, to win the contract to do it. Now, one thing that you got to keep in mind, because from a general contractor's position, and this is very different, you know, we do a lot of work uh, primarily actually in the commercial space versus the residential space. In the commercial space, we actually front the project. So we have to front the cash to start the project. Then we have a different pay schedule where we get paid back. And so we're fronting our subcontractors versus residential. Typically, the owner or... You don't get paid until the job's done, right? No, actually, they front it. So actually, oh, the, okay. whoever is hiring the general contractor is going to be fronting the cash. So it's, it's a very different model from residential to commercial, One thing to keep in mind when it comes to pay on the residential side, residential contractors absolutely love to do cost plus. So whatever the cost is plus, and then they'll typically do like a management fee. Well, there's no reason for that general contractor to work fast or find the best bid because they make cost plus, right? So what incentive do they have to stay on time because they make more money when it takes longer and find a lower bid because they make more money when it costs more. There's no incentive, but everybody wants that because they think when I say they, that means residential owners, residential investors think, oh, well, I'll get to see the line item. I'll get to see everything. When in reality, it's actually hurting them. 
in commercial, it's hard bid. It's a stipulated hard bid. And so here is the cost of the project. We stay within that period. So we're not coming back being like, oh, this costs more. Or, oh, you know what? Um, oh, shoot, we found this issue. Like we got to do, we stay within that bid. And the longer we stay on the project, the less money we make. So we have an incentive to hurry up, to get, get it done, not hurry and miss quality. We have a, it, it's a very important when it comes to scheduling. Where in residential, it's, I've heard of projects taking the year that we've done in six weeks which is unbelievable. So I think that's the thing is like understanding how you're going to be paying them, who's going to be fronting it. Also understand the schedule because if the schedule is not set and they don't have it, that can create an incredible ripple effect to all the other tradesmen that have to come in and do the work. One of the things that we do is Shane, my brother-in-law runs all of this side Mm -hmm. of things, but I know he doesn't pay until the work is done. So he pays them every day though. So he has these people come in and he acts like the general contractor himself because he subcontracts out everything. Mm -hmm. And he finds these workers to come in and do the thing. And every day they're getting paid end of day. And he won't give them a bonus if they get it done like quicker than they're supposed to be. What would you tell people? Like I have a student right now, she's in Oklahoma and she's going to find, she's going to find, you know, all the people to do the flip for her. So she's going out and subcontracting. What advice would you give that person? The first thing I would absolutely tell her is to ask for references for any of the subcontractors that she hires, because it's scary out there because there's a lot of, and this will lead actually to point two, there's a lot of uninsured and unlicensed contractors out there. So if they're unwilling to give you a reference, red flag, step away, find the next one. Also ask their insurance and um, licensing to make sure that you're protected, right? Because if you're hiring handyman Bob, you're going to get handyman Bob work, right? (laughs) Nothing against him. But if you want to have a business, which I know you're, you're helping a lot of entrepreneurs is you got to run it like a business. So if they don't qualify next and keep moving on, setting the expectation like I said, for communication and timeliness. So that is going to be incredibly important, but that also falls on whoever is hiring them. You know, first off, I would say hire a contractor, but that's another story. Having that like expectation on scheduling. So if you are going to hi- like order all of your bathroom fixtures, you're going to order all the tile, you're going to order all the granite, you're going to do that. You need to work with whoever is going to be installing to understand the schedule and when you need to order. Because a lot of times you they could be like, well, we're ready for tile. We're ready. And you're like, oh, shoot, I forgot to or- order. And then you go to order and it's a six weeks delay. Well, that's not the contractor's yeah. problem. Like that's not their issue. That's something that you have to take on. So you have to start thinking about all of these things ahead of time and then working with your subs to be able to schedule it out. So it's a lot of communication. It's a lot of juggling. But first off, references, licensing, insurance, done. Oh, good. So good. I heard a story the other day, and this isn't inside of my group, but in another group, I'm just like a free Facebook group. Mm -hmm. Somebody had paid uh, the general contractor 10 grand, like up front, and then came back later and said that he actually wasn't going to be able to like finish the job. And so the guy's like, okay, and give me my 10 grand back. And the guy wouldn't give him the 10 grand back because he was like, well, I took the time to bid. I did all these things. And so now he's finding out that the guy like was never licensed in the first place because he was going to take him to the board. And so now it's like this big, huge mess. He's probably not going to get his money back because the guy's like ran away with it. So I think it's really important to take that time to do that due diligence. This is with anything, not even just with contractors, but with anybody that you are hiring, do your due diligence because there are so many horror stories that I've heard in just life in general (laughs) by just going, oh, it sounded good. So that's what I went Mm -hmm. with, right? So, oh my gosh, I love seeing you in this element, Shelly. I'm telling you, like, it's so fun to see you in this like business mode. I love it. You have so many good things to say. You're great at networking. I see yourself like out there, you know, just being at all the events, being at all the masterminds. 
you're really good at creating relationships. So teach us like how to create relationships that are win-win now that you look at relationships differently, right? Like everybody can win. That's the first step. And, you know, obviously, thank you for the kind words. I'm still a work in progress here. The first thing was changing my mindset, walking into the room. So I wasn't walking in the room to get, I was walking in the room to give. So anytime I'm in the room with anybody, I'm always like, how can I help them? What can I do? And again, I was not raised that way. I was getting, I was, I was taking from everybody so that I could win. And now I qualify winning for me is giving. How much can I give? So who can I connect them to that I know? What answer can I give them? How can I, can I get them a cup of coffee? Cause I can tell maybe they had a rough night with the baby. Like, I don't know, like what it is, how can I help them is going to be the biggest thing that I've had. a have just had an incredible experience with. And, you know, I was the, I was the woman that was like, Oh my gosh, I hate other women. I can't be around other women. I don't want to be around other women. That was me. I was talking about myself. And so now I just look at each woman and and how incredible they are in their own way. And some people I vibe with and some people I don't. And that's okay. Move on. Next. You know, who else can I help? Let me help you. And sometimes help is even supporting. So, you know, I went to a launch event, um, a jewelry uh, launch event. I bought a, a ton of pieces. I'm like, let me support you. And now I'm wearing them. And like, let me support you. Let me tell my friends about you. It all comes back tenfold, you know? And so it's like, how can I support you? What does that look like? What do you need from me? Is it a listening ear? I'm all here for it. So I think that's the biggest thing is like what, like walking in the room and what can I give rather than what can I get? Love that. So what are you interested in investing in right now? Well, two things. Um, actually it's, it's funny because we have what you think is like, we have a perfect skill. We should be flipping homes. We should be flipping, you know, commercial buildings all the time. What we're actually investing in right now is two things. One, well, let me say three things. One is us, number one, always. So what trips are we going to take? What are we going to do? Chris and I have already had two trips, solo trips this year. We have another one planned. So that is an investment in us. The second one is we're actually looking at, and we, we are making an investment in a newer startup, a business. So we're actually investing in some different businesses. We're looking at that. We uh, paired with that, we're looking at probably investing starting new next year in some different real estate funds, because quite honestly, the real estate fund is something that is more appealing to us because our business, it's so busy that we can't um, dedicate the time and attention to managing our own real estate portfolio right now. But so we're looking at businesses, real estate um, funds, and then um, I'm always re investing in my education, whatever that looks like. So whether it's a course, an event, I went to a realtor event, absolutely loved it. I was the only general contractor in there. It was a room full of realtors and lenders. I learned so much and made amazing connections. So yeah. Yeah. You're always pouring back into yourself. Well, you know, I have my real estate fund. We're doing an apartment complex in Scottsdale ah, right now. Very cool. I yeah. love it. I love it. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, just to point out why investing in a private equity fund works for most, most professionals is because, you know, when you don't pay attention to an active investment, that's when you start losing money. And if I, I always say like, focus on your zone of genius, right? Stay at the, and make a lot of money in this lane and then make your money work hard for you with the people who are the operators. Yep. And that's the reason why I got into the fund world years ago was because like, I didn't know enough and I didn't have the time to operate. I was running mommy millionaire, doing all the things like, where can the money go? And I know I can get cash flow plus an equity multiple by the time they exit. And, you know, we've gone into storage units, multifamily, single family funds. So anyways, it is a really great opportunity for those of you guys that are interested in investing in the apartment complex, make sure to go to prosper.investnext.com. We'll make sure to link it up in the show notes. And, you know, when you said investing in businesses, I want to talk about this because I want to see what your criteria is, because I used to do a lot of this years ago when I just wanted to help people mm -hmm. out. And I even raised money for somebody that we still have yet to see 
a return on that investment. Anyways, but now I have a, I have really solid criteria if it's a startup or, you know, somebody else's business, because I used to go, well, if I believe in the person, I'll invest in it. Now I got, I had to add about 10 more things onto it Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I don't like losing money. When you lose enough money in investments, you, you start to create criteria. So what is the criteria for you to invest in businesses? So the first thing for us to, to look at is obviously market size. So I want to understand the market size because if it's too niched, I don't think it's going to serve. It's got to be a much larger market size than just tiny little thing over here. And that might go against the grain, right? Everyone says like, you know, the riches are in the niches. I actually, when it comes to a business, I want to look at kind of more of a boring, stable, large market business is number one. Number two, it's got to be something that I like. So I'm not going to invest in something that I don't know about. So the company that we're investing in is a health related company. As you know, that is something that I'm very passionate about. My podcast is named The Business of Being Healthy. I mean, this is a very, very big, passionate part for me. So that is something, it has to be something that I know about because when it comes to products or um, direct to consumer products, I need to know whether it's going to work. And if I understand the industry, I can tell you whether the product is going to work or not. The other thing is I want to know who is supporting the CEO or the founder. Again, kind of bringing it back to my childhood, I we did a lot not having support. Now that we have support in, you know, community and mentors and all of that, the results are exponential. And so if it's a founder that is like my old mindset, I will run because I know what that produces. While it will produce results, it's going to be long and it's going to be hard. I want someone that is humble enough to say, you know what, I don't know any, I don't know enough. And here's who I have on my team advising me. So I want to know who is behind them. The other thing is uh, time horizon. So time horizon on investment is essentially, you know, I'm not looking when we make an investment, we're not looking, it's not like flipping a home, right? It's, it's not like something that we're going to do really quick and be like, okay, we can be in and out of this and 1031 it over into the next property. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking more for a long-term investment. So I would say at this point, what we're looking at is five to 10 years. That's important to point out the time horizon because it's how long can you be without that, that capital? So if you're going to invest in this business, are you good with not seeing that hundred thousand dollars for another 10 years? And if the answer is no, then that's the wrong investment for you right? You have to assess your risk tolerance and just say like, how, how quickly do I need this back? Um, and everybody has different goals. So if you're willing to, um, you're like, well, that equity multiple is going to be worth it for me to get it back in 10 years. It's going to beat inflation, beat the market, um, beat the stock market, then that's a win. So that's exciting. Yeah. I always say too, for everybody listening in, it's like diversify your portfolio, right? If you're going to invest in startups, okay. What else do you have that's backed by dirt? So she's going into real estate funds as well. The other thing you could think about doing too is alternative financing. You know, we have a cash advance syndication that's also helping. We actually help a lot of people in construction. This is Chase's business. But anyway, it's, it, there's so many things to, to think about when you're getting into investing, make sure you're diversifying. I love that. Yeah. I'm so excited for all of you. What is the last thing you want to leave for all the crafted entrepreneurs? Gosh. Um, you know, I think the, the thing that has helped us the most is as entrepreneurs, we can sometimes go big vision and we like, oh, we love this. We love this. I want to do this. I want to do this. It's actually, you're spreading yourself so thin. There's only so much time in the day. There's only so much attention that you can give. And the one thing, not the one thing, but one of the biggest things that Chris and I made was that shift in taking complete focus on the one thing because we, our other businesses were doing well, they were doing well, but none of them were doing great. And as soon as we got rid of all of the distractions of all the other businesses, all the other things that we had going on and that we got focused on the one and put all the effort into it, have we seen incredible results? And it's honestly alleviated a lot of stress. It's alleviating a lot of stress because we know what we need to do to drive results versus kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall sometimes or at the window. So that's what I would say is just if you feel spread thin, 
There's a reason for that. Come back, find what could maybe meet your income needs the fastest or that you could scale the fastest and come back to that and go all in. Love that. Where can everybody find you, Shelly? The best place to find me is over on Instagram. It's my name, Shelly Bryan, S-H-E-L-E-Y-B-R-I-E-N. It is spelled funny, so make sure you find that. Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn as well. I would love to invite your listeners to come over and listen on the show for Business of Being Healthy. You can find that on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. There's a great episode with Kayla as well. Um, You're going to want to find that. And I have some amazing downloads as well, freebies on my website. So I encourage you to stop there. I'm kind of all over. (laughs) That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Shelly. I know that people learned a lot. We talked about all different sorts of things. So I know they got a lot of nuggets. Make sure to take a screenshot of this episode and tag us both on social media. Thanks for listening in. Thank you. Thank you.